So I encourage you to visit the homepage of uh, Professor Rzeczkowski. Uh, today we have talk about quantum, about this uh, quantum Sudoku. You see the title here on the screen. It's based on a paper which was written in between by Grzegorz Reichel Miedzioc, former PhD student of Karol. And this paper was uh, distinguished by the American Physical Society. Uh, so you could see short note in the viewpoint about it. Uh, we have heard about this topic a few times, but in very short version. And today we have opportunity to understand everything and to enjoy the talk of the main professor responsible for the project. So, Carol, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, is yours, sorry. Krzysztof. It's my great pleasure to be here with you in Warsaw, just to go out of my place and to see that the world exists, Warsaw exists, CFT, uh, Pan is doing fine. So it's really amazing to see that after two years, not so much has changed. And indeed, I'm very, very pleased to be offered a chance to talk to you here on site. Indeed, I'm going to discuss a paper which appeared one year ago, and therefore this decomposition makes some sense of our year 2022. And indeed, there are six authors, this is important, two of them from India, Suhail and Arul from Chennai, two of them from Krakow, but key hero here is Grzegorz Reichel Miedzioj. He got his PhD here at Center and the Council conferred PhD degree just last week. I believe that majority of you, at least in my generation, know the name of Szczepan Jeleński at the book Lilavati and Światami Pythagorasa. I believe the best mathematical, uh, let's say, uh, books for students. And those who know those books are aware of Latin squares and magic squares. By the way, Stepan Jelenski was not a mathematician himself. He was an engineer educated here in Warsaw, but he wrote a lot of books in different subjects, also those two uh, famous books uh, popularizing mathematics. So what is a magic square? It is just a square of numbers that sum of all entries in each column, each row is constant. What is a Latin square? In fact, I will already use the Greco-Latin square. This is a square of objects. Greco-Latin means a pair of letters. First is Greek, second is Latin, therefore a name. And as you can see, all of them, in this case, nine combinations of letters are different. In each row, each column, there's only a single letter from Greek and Latin alphabet. By the way, those two objects are coupled in the sense that if you have such a Greek or Latin square, you can immediately write exactly this magic square by just putting into the entry ij, uh, d is the size, so in this case it will be 3, and uh, alpha and beta are the indices which run from 0 to 2. So, such designs, of so Sudoku designs will be mentioned later, are of course a subject of recreational mathematics. But also, this is not only a game, they are related to many serious um, serious branches of mathematics, including statistics, planning of experiments, and some other sophisticated combinatorial research. I will also claim they are important for physics and theoretical physics. First statement, what is a classical combinatorial design? Okay, there are two examples. In a more general abstract definition, it's a nice constellation of elements of a finite set arranged in a special way with a certain symmetry and balance. You see here some symmetries and balance. And for physicists, look, this is a magic square, but if we divide this square by 15, 15 is some of the, uh, those uh, numbers in each row column, we get a bistochastic matrix. Of course, such a stochastic, bistochastic matrices are known in physics uh, to describe, let's say, Markov chains and um, transition in the space of probability vectors. Is now the voice okay? By the way, if you have any questions, you can just uh, raise your hand or even without raising your hands, you can just stop me at any moment and ask questions if something is not clear. So, well, uh, let me show you another example of Greek or Latin squares, which are also called mutually orthogonal. Let's take four aces, four kings, four queens, and four jacks. So we have 16 cards, and we wish to arrange them in such a nice design and array, such that in every row, every column, there is only a single card of each suit and of each rank. And of course, this is doable. Here is an exemplary solution. 
There are many of those solutions. Some combinatorics, uh, people working in combinatorics, for instance, for many years they were counting how many of those solutions exist. As you can guess, it's a difficult problem uh, for higher dimension. So Greek or Latin, here I have cards. So instead of Greek letters, I have um, cards. And instead of uh, Latin, I have suits. So it is a nice example of Greek or Latin squares of size four, mutually orthogonal means one is orthogonal is Latin square obtained with aces, kings, uh, queens, and jacks. Second is obtained with the um, suits, and orthogonal means that basically uh, all of those cards are different. So there are no two uh, queen of spades or king of kings of diamonds. As simple as that. And those objects are known for many, many years, even before Euler, for instance, this object was discussed, maybe for recreational mathem uh, mathematics. In fact, it was used with cards also, like in the 17th century, I believe. And it's easy to show that there are no, for L, D equal 2, there are no orthogonal Latin squares. Why? Well, it's easy to show. If I take here, let's say, um, ace of spades and put king of spades here, what is remaining, for instance, ace of um, hearts and king of hearts? So I take third card, ace of uh, um, hearts, and I cannot put it neither here nor there, because, of course, in two columns, in, the, in the one column, we would have uh, two hearts or two spades. So this is very simple to convince yourself that such design is not uh, possible for uh, size d equal to but it is possible for three, four, and five. So you have seen already examples for three and four. For five, they also exist. OK, I was thinking I explained it here. Orthogonal means two squares are orthogonal, which practically means there is only one ace of spades here, one jack of spades. Because you uh, non-orthogonal would mean that sometimes you have two aces, so two cards, two uh, uh, cards are the same. They are not. So one, uh, what is orthogonal? One Latin square is produced by aces, kings, uh, queens, and jacks. Second one is produced by um, uh, suits, and we say that they are orthogonal if there are no two cards which are the same. Okay. Thanks for the question. And. For d equals 6, something happens. Here, moles means mutually orthogonal Latin square. So you have two of them. You can have three. They are called mutually orthogonal, exactly like this way they are orthogonal. But in the case of d equals 6, there is only a single Latin square. And this problem was, in fact, discussed by Euler himself. And there is a famous problem of a kind of military problem of 36 officers. So the motivation was very practical. In St. Petersburg, he Euler stayed there in St. Petersburg at the end of um, 18th century. Um, some clever officers realized if you have 25 officers from five different units, each unit had different uh, kind of uniform, and five different ranks, you could just arrange them at the parade in such a way that in each column, each row, all uniforms are different. So the child, Catherine the Great, could look from above and enjoy such a nice constellation. However, as they added sixth unit, and they were thinking, ah, let's take six kind of officers, um, they realized it's not doable, and they asked famous Euler to solve the problem. So you see now a very practical motivation, and therefore this is in literature, it's called Euler's problem of 36 officers. So the task is to arrange them in a square in such a way that in each row and each column all uniforms are different. And Euler was very much amazed that no solution exists. And even Euler, such a great mathematician, was not able to prove this fact. He only made a lot of conjectures. For instance, he was okay, convinced that solution does not exist. He conjectured also that such con mm, solution will not exist for size 10 and uh, 14. Why for 10? 10 is 5 times 2, another product of two numbers. It's not a, neither a prime number nor a power of prime. And only 121 years later, a French, in fact not a mathematician, also a lawyer, he solved the problem and published it in 1900. It was kind of brute force solution. So first he managed to compute that the number of possibilities is like millions, but he reduced it to the, let's say, of order of 4,000 classes of solutions, and then he could check that in each class mm, there is no solution.
Mm. Well, maybe, oh, sorry, thank you very much. Maybe there is some mistake here. Maybe it should have been 17. So, yes, yes, thank you very much. Yes, yes, yes. You're right. This is simple, yes. Um, so let me go back to this problem of Euler. We will have to wait a little bit for physics. Uh, so like uh, introduction exercise in the chess language. Let's take a small board, chess board six times six. And let's take six rocks and place them in such a way that they do not attack each other. So this is simple. For instance, this is one possible solution. So we did it with rocks. The next step will be we add other figures. So here it is. So rocks stay where they are, but let's say we put six pawns here, 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 and the rules are the same. The rules are that if pawns, if pawns were rocks, they cannot attack each other, assuming that all other figures are not there. So this is exactly the same condition that there's only one pawn in each row, each column. And you see this is the solution. Sorry? No, no, color is very relevant. Wait a second. Here, wh what you are saying is that I need, no, no, that I need to buy, I need to buy three set of, of ch uh, chess, what I can afford, to have six uh, black rocks. This is uh, black ch uh, chess, yes? This is the issue. Okay, so if I buy four, three sets of chess, I can take six black, six black uh, horses, knights, uh, to put such a constellation. Yes, but it's not difficult to buy uh, ad uh, additional six uh, for uh, black rocks to put them to put them into the pattern. Yes. No, okay. Well, wait. 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 Okay. Here I assume I have under my disposal six black rocks. Here I assume I have six black rocks, black uh, bishops, black uh, queens, and whatever, and I make such a solution. And this solution, it's exactly a Latin square of size six. Why? Because in each column, each row, you have only one uh, object of any kind. And this is the definition. This pattern satisfies the definition of single orthogonal Latin square. Okay, Ukash, are you with me? But colors, I'm very pleased that you ask about colors. I'm very pleased that you ask about colors because colors is the next step. So of course this is just the opposite. Colors are very important. So here I just introduce colors. By the way, with the rules of uh, with the rules of rocks. Yes, 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 of course. So I emphasized before I started with rocks, I mentioned that this is exactly so. I said if they were rocks and all other um, figures were not there. With respect to kings, but not with respect to uh, rocks, I presume. Okay, so, okay, of course, this is only a symbolic game. Uh, I assume here that all figures, in a sense, they are kind of rocks of different kind. But here, as Professor Tulski asked me to use colors, I use colors, so now to have two orthogonal Latin squares, I not only to need to put a, sim a single system, a single uh, digit, but two digits, one digit for the figure and second for the color. For instance, I take six colors and I can easily color, this is exactly the same pattern as here. I use six colors and I start doing it and I'm very fine because, look, there's only one green object here in first column, first row, uh, uh, and so on. Everything is fine, but I just left it as a small exercise for you. Now there are four missing objects. We know there is one knight missing, one rock, one pawn, and one bishop. And the task is we should put them here according to the rules of Euler. So what is missing? Two cyan and two green colors. And it's unfortunately easy to convince yourself that this solution is not possible. You have there are not so many <laughs> possibilities to check. Of course, in the paper of Tarid, he checked many, many more, many more, many more things. Basically, you see a contradiction. If you want to, let's say, color this green and put it here, you will contradiction have if you want to put a rock uh, painted cyan and put it here. So this is an example that. It's not possible to find the solution of the problem of Euler, and Euler was right, such a solution does not exist. 
I'm very pleased for all the questions. Do you understand this picture? This is the key picture. And this is known for at least 200 years. By the way, if you put, it will play some role in the story. If you do something, whatever you can, and put those four objects here and paint them in cyan and green, it, not all conditions will be satisfied, but you will have a fair approximation to the solution. Possibly the best possible. So here I explicitly mention that this is not doable, which was proven only many years later. Well, I would uh, like to show you such a nice game you can buy in the good shops of games, which is called 36 Cube, which was invented only in 2008. Some people claim it's written the world's most challenging puzzle, which exactly mimics the pro mathematical problem. By the way, it's very nice to see a game which is exactly related to mathematics, to serious mathematics. So the game is very simple. You have 36 objects and of six different colors and of six different heights. So basically, you see, they are like, this is like general of cavalry, this will be like lieutenant of uh, artillery and whatever, in the language of Euler. And you have to arrange them in such a way that in each row, each column, there are different colors, and then the heights of those imply that in each row, each color, there are uh, different heights, so different ranks. So here, you see, do you understand the question? You get 36 objects, you have to put them, very nice game, very nice puzzle. But if you look here, you might think, well, something is strange, because you, if you look at the colors, you can easily see that each color, it's really, mm, those conditions are satisfied, you have only one red color in each row, each column. So you might think, well, maybe Euler was wrong, because this is apparent solution of the problem. And then this makes a great difference between physics and mathematics. So in mathematics, Euler was right. And in physics, how do you think? What is the clue uh, concerning this constellation? No, 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 we are not. No, but we are blind concerning height. So there is the key point is that the height here, in principle, it looks like this. But the, there is a catch. So of course, mathematically, theorem is correct, but this game relies on the fact that two of those objects, they are basically of height 4, but in fact they are of height 3 because somehow it will not go as um, deep as it should. So it's a very nice game, but basically this is the approximate solution I showed you, which is used to, to produce such an object, so nothing is wrong with mathematics, and this is a nice example of a game related exactly to this problem. Uh, yes? No, is, is it fine, or you have some other? Well, okay, engineering, but physics means, in my language, that it's real-world solution. So real-world solution, of course, with a kind of some approximation. So, of course, it's not exact. So, uh, this is uh, concerning classical combinatorial designs. As you know, we discuss also quantum physics and quantum formalism. And here I will mention an interesting PhD paper by Gerhard Zauner. It was originally defended in 1999 in Vienna. So the, as you see, title was Quantum Designs Grundzüge einer nicht commutativen Design Theory. And my friend uh, Ingemar Bengtsson, who knows languages and uh, literature, he claims it is the last thesis written uh, in German, which really influenced um, physics or science, because it was really amazing uh, thesis, and many people not knowing uh, German were trying to digest it, and only 10 years later, uh, somebody convinced him, and he, with some help of some other people, translated into English, now it's also English uh, version published, if you wish. But, the main idea is very simple. Any good classical concept can be quantized, yes? Mm, I'm sorry, I forgot now. Maybe known, but now I forgot. Sorry, I, I, I can check it. Okay, here. You have seen perhaps Sudoku. So this is, okay, it's very difficult to give a very nice, very general definition as usual, but looking at the Sudoku, this is a small Sudoku to make it simpler, you will immediately see here balance means that you have only one symbol, one in each row, each column, moreover in each block there is only one symbol of, of the given color. But here colors are related to numbers, so this is standard Sudoku. So balance in the same sense, symmetry. yes, so sometimes it's symmetry, 
Uh, by the way, in combinatorics, there are some balanced designs, so they, are defin they define it more precisely. But in general, for us, it is any nice combination which satisfies some prescribed rules. And combinatorics, uh, people working in combinatorics. There is a certain to yes, exactly. And there are many problems which are taken from the real world, uh, which are very well known in combinatorics. For instance, one such a question, very famous, is a question about, I think, 21 girls going to school. Do you know it? They went to England, British school, uh, 150, uh, 150 years ago, and the task was that they were ordered, like, mm, I think, in the in three uh, girls, and the task was that each day they went to school every day, and they had to have go with other uh, mates to talk to. And there was kind of constellation to put, uh, put make seven. Uh, wow. Okay, but the example is still known and nice in combinatorics. Now, going back to Zauner, the idea is very simple. You take some good classical concept and you try to quantize it. Of course, it's not a canonical quantization. It is, again, a rule of thumb. You want to do something which basically allows you to go out of the classical set of solutions and look for more quantum objects. So here I will start with, okay, first I will mention that in his thesis, he used it for a very serious um, objects known in quantum uh, mechanics, which are used for like generalized quantum measurements, like one is name is six symmetric informationally complete measurements. In fact, this was not uh, this name was not used in this thesis, or mutually unbiased bases. But we'll not discuss them here. Here I will start with this classical Sudoku. So you know very well what is Sudoku. This is a small one. So you have here four numbers. But first. So c combinatorics this deals with discrete objects, like discrete here, one, two, three. So now I will say, ah, but instead of numbers, I will take vectors from the Hilbert space. In this case, uh, Hilbert space of size four. So basically the trick is, well, it's nothing. I just put here cats and I say, ah, this will be a solution of the problem. Classically, I say all those numbers are different. Quantum mechanically, I will say, oh, what means different? They can be distinguished. So two vectors, when I can, then they can be distinguished, they are orthogonal. Definition is simple. I have a constellation of quantum states, and I wish to um, require that in each row, each column, we have orthogonal bases. For Sudoku, I also require that you have bases in each block. As simple as that. But of course, you can say, that oh, this is trivial, because I only put cats here. Yes, this example is trivial. I just took the classical solution and put here cats. But you can find other solutions, less trivial. This is almost, almost a trivial solution. Instead of one and two, I take superposition states. One plus two, one minus two. But this is only by taking rotation in sub subspace one, two, you get such a solution. But here, you have only four different objects, four different states, and only a single orthogonal basis. All those bases in each row, each column are the same. Yes, yes, yes. Colors do not have any, uh, yes. Colors are only two, yes, yes. Two, uh, they are related here to, um, so they are, of course, uh, yes, this is simpler. So th this uh, constellation we can call uh, like apparently quantum Sudoku. It's quantum, but it can be taken to the classical case by unitary rotation. But this Sudoku is much more interesting. We have exactly uh, all together, of course, 16 elements, but now look, all of them are different. So we have 16 different states. Moreover, each basis is different. This basis is not the same as this basis, this basis, this basis, this basis. So we have all together four in columns, four in rows, and four in blocks. So three times four, 12 different bases. So it's a nice constellation of 12 different bases which produce such a pattern. Okay, one is again recreational mathematics or physics. Second is related to quantum measurements. We have a nice set of 12 different measurements generated by those states. So this was also a paper uh, produced by uh, Grzegorz, and I think even this very design is his. So uh, this is an example of a more serious uh, notion, first introduced in the British paper by Vicar and Musto in 2016, which basically concerns the name of quantum Latin squares. The definition is extremely simple. We take d square states and put them into an array, and we call them quantum Latin. If each 
row and column forms an orthogonal basis. Here you have a basis, here a basis. This is an example from this paper. And again, this is a really quantum example because look here we have four states, standard computational basis, and for other states they are just here like superposition states. Uh, which act, okay, here they are in different subspaces. So now you have eight states involved in this pattern and they satisfy all rules. You have orthogonal basis vertically and horizontally. So now look, standard combinatorics deals with discrete symbols and the key object is permutation group, which is discrete. Of course, if D is huge, then there's a lot of possibilities to check. So the problem is non trivial. But still, everything is discrete. In the generalized version, we can call now quantum, like quantum combinatorics. Basically, everything is almost the same, but instead of objects, we have now continuous family of states, which live in the Hilbert space. For instance, for d equal to, we have the famous block sphere, so any point at the sphere pointing somewhere is a, a good state, and of course, you can, in a continuous way, join any two points from the sphere. And therefore, the key object here is unitary group which is, in a sense, much larger. And, of course, it includes, as a small, 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 small subset, the group of permutation matrices. So, now, another generalization. In the language of Euler, he discussed orthogonal Latin squares. It is the same as Greek or Latin square. And now we define quantum orthogonal Latin squares. To remind you, classical, can be written like this. We have d square pairs of d symbols such that all those pairs are different, like here, and there's no repetition of any symbol in each row and each column. So how to look for the quantum analogs of those three conditions? First one is simple. Since they are different, it means now we define our quantum orthogonal Latin squares as a array of d square bipartite states. So they those states belong to HD times HD, or we can sometimes call it HA times HB. For instance, A corresponds to the um, figures, and subspace B corresponds to the suits. And they should be mutually orthogonal. This is simple. So it means that all those states are different. And the condition that there is no repetition of any symbol each row, each column, means that we basically disregard uh, suits and discuss only figures or otherwise, which can be translated into partial trace condition. So we have partial trace conditions summing over k here or there, which corresponds to rows and columns. So this is exactly an um, equivalent or analog of this classical condition. Maybe it's not so simple to see, but basically it means if you had repetition, it will not be, this operator will not be uh, proportional to identity. Identity is as symmetric as possible. So this is now again a classical kind of example of quantum orthogonal Latin squares. This is in a sense trivial. I took those cards and again, as before, put cats. And this means that I work with product states. So K can be written like, ah, this is K tensor claps. So this is a product state. And to get something new, something really quantum, genuinely quantum, as we say, we need to introduce entanglement. So perhaps you know what is entanglement, but it will be play a key role in the further um, discussion. Um, so I will make a very, very short introduction. If we, to talk about entanglement, we need to talk about two objects. So let's assume we have two spins. One is here, one is there. And if they are not correlated, state is product. Entanglement means there is a correlation between two subsystems. For instance, if one is up, second is up, or if one is down, second is down. Formally, we define separable pure states are just product states, and Entangled pure state is just any state not of this four. A simple, very well known, in a sense, famous example is the Bell state. So, zero, zero, plus one, one, you can translate it in our bridge language like ace of a superposition of ace of spades plus king of clubs, for instance. And those states, on one hand, they are amazing, they are non classical, because measuring um, one subsystem. If you get zero, you can predict the outcome on the other subsystem. However, there is no contradiction with the 
special relativity. You cannot transmit information. You can only predict results, but you cannot transmit information faster than light. On the other hand, they are very important and useful for many applications in quantum technologies, like dense coding, quantum teleportation, or perhaps almost all algorithms in quantum information are based on quantum entanglement. Yes? You are right, okay, yes, okay, you are right, I agree, I agree, but I want to say that, okay, uh, usually I have, okay, uh, let's assume we have two features, like the size of the card and the suit, which are in principle first separated, but of course then, of course you are right, if you describe them by two, if you already have a card, then it's already somehow too late. So I see that I agree that this, okay, but uh, this is kind of a um, descriptive language which, which can be used. Uh, yes, but this is exactly, it, it corresponds to, uh, to this state, yes? Thank you. So mathematically, you can say, ah, if you take any state, you can decompose it in a product basis. So ij is a product basis in the bipartite system. And now we can use the standard mathematical trick, take this matrix and use so-called singular value decomposition. This is the formula. So we multiply from left and right by unitaries. And then this diagonal matrix consists of singular values. And the singular values, they form the spectrum of partial trace of such a matrix. And then this vector, sometimes called Schmidt vector, the spectrum of partial trace, determines entanglement. And you can measure this entanglement by entanglement entropy, which is equal to von Neumann entropy of the reduced state, which is maximal for the Bell state. So this is only to show that this word maximal has sense. You have a reasonable measure of entanglement, and indeed it is maximized for this Bell state. So therefore, the Bell states are distinguished. Those correlations between subsystems as, are as strong as possible. Going back to quantum orthogonal Latin squares, we know that there are no classical uh, Latin squares of size 2. So first guess is whether this game of putting, instead of one, two figures, at least two, would help. And you can have such constellation. Now I use Chess language. Basically, instead of rock, I put a combination, okay, superposition better, of a, let's say black rock and white pawn and so on. And then you can check with many, many different cases and the answer is kind of negative so basically you can show that those three conditions are never satisfied and it's not such a great uh, surprise because basically this fact follows from the old paper by Higuchi and Sarberry already from 2001. So the statement is that if you work as much as you can using any entangled states, having such a square, so in fact it means a four states of two qubits, you will not find a good solution to the problem. Well, what about size six? I was, uh, I promised you to tell you about 36 entangled officers of Euler. So our approach was we knew that classical solution does not exist and now I try to offer you a quantum solution. The fact that states are entangled means that instead of one figure here, I have here two or more figures. In fact, here you see you have three or four, not more. More are not necessary, it's enough two and four. Now look, in principle what you would like to have in each color, column there's only one color and one um, figure. This is not possible, but I claim that this particular solution, which has very nice symmetry. Look, green and uh, yellow are here, so bluish are there, and red here, so this is also like um, Latin, coarse grain Latin square. It satisfies all those required conditions, and it will be an example of such a quantum orthogonal Latin square of size six. Quantum, because you have in each point superposition of states. But if you look closer, you will see immediately a problem. What kind of a problem? The first condition is that all those states are mutually orthogonal. But you say, hey, this is wrong because I see, let's uh, here, so at the point 
at the field C2, you see purple um, holes and a pawn is exactly as here. So something must be wrong because they are the same. This field is the same as here. Something is wrong. This is a correct observation, but this is not yet a full solution. You have a, here a superposition of two states, but you are free to add phases, even complex phases. And to show you a full solution, I didn't want to scare you too much, but here now I will show you a full solution. So full solution is exactly the same pattern as before, but each symbol is decorated by some numbers. Those numbers denote complex phases, and here a miracle occurs, because those phases are rational, they are powers of 20 roots of identity. So they are e to pi k 20 over 20, and k is just a number listed here. So now let's go to this case. Here we have 0 and 10, because this is modulo 20, so 10 means minus. So this field is exactly like Bell state holds minus pawn because of this 10, and will be orthogonal to this. So this is the full solution. The full solution of the problem is encoded in this very nice chessboard. And what is easy to see, relatively easy, if you compare, let's say, this field and this field, check those phases, you will see they are orthogonal. You can also see, of course, if they are of different colors, they will be orthogonal. If they are different figures, they will be also orthogonal. What is a bit more complicated to see, for instance, that you have orthogonality, let's say here, if you have two yellow um, uh, pawns together, but this is possible to be done. It's a little bit more difficult to see that those conditions that you see immediately, that those conditions concerning each color or each figure in row and column are satisfied, but it is so. So basically, the, our achievement was to finding such an object, which is first of all analytical, and second, it's really a miracle that all those numbers are, in a sense, obtained analytically. What I emphasize again, that the phases are known and are given here by those numbers, and then the size of the figures denote the size so amplitudes in the superposition. So if you have the same size, this is just this bell state um, of two objects of the same weight. If you have three of them, then, uh, okay, this is larger, smaller, and smaller, so the relative size is also known. So basically, this pattern corresponds to the following formula. So now, basically, we take and say, ah, this symbol here, in the first uh, upper corner, it corresponds to such a state, which in one, okay, the standard mat um, quantum mechanics language, we can write it like this. So here, digits go from zero to six, or in the chess language like this, where omega is this root of, tw of one of order 20, and those coefficients A, B, C are known, and they uh, okay, satisfy Pythagorean law, but also the ratio of those two A and B is a very famous number, which is also not a coincidence. It is the golden mean. And then, so all those formula allow us in a very simple way to check the solution is correct. And because of this golden mean, we believe it is fair to call this solution uh, like a golden square or golden solution because of this golden mean. So as you see here, everything is known analytically and all this huge solution can be encoded in this nice pattern where the figures, colored figures, are decorated by numbers which denote complex faces. So uh, do you have any questions? Because Nick, okay, I will try to discuss how to get the solution later on, possibly if time permits, but do you understand the solution? Yes, there's a question, please. As you can guess, one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we were looking for other solutions, but in fact, all those we found, they were somehow locally equivalent. So we have not identified yet uh, another solution, but of course they might exist, but we don't know. But a very, very nice question, thank you. Yes, another question? Yes, 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 we do, we do. Uh, this is, okay, not only intuition, but we can somehow pr prove. No, no, look, to be honest, we have not guessed this, okay? I don't think uh, any human being could guess this solution. So, of course, we somehow, well, got it by kind of educated guess, and those numbers occurred as a solution of some equations. Yes? Yes? 
Classically, yes. Of course not, but we were okay. But first of all, but very very nice question. For d equal to, we can show that okay, people knew already. Neither classical nor quantum solution exists. Now, for d equal six, it was the first and the only case where there is only a single uh, Latin square. So because of Euler and Tari, no solution was known to exist, and nobody knew whether quantum solution will exist or will not. And for, to be honest, uh, we were thinking it doesn't exist, so Grzegorz found a very good approximation to it, and for two years we were thinking we will not go any further, and this solution was shown to be a local uh, external of some function, and we were almost starting to write the paper that solution does not exist. But fortunately, now there are six authors of the paper, one Indian student of my colleague, Professor Aru Lakshminarayan, was not aware that we write a paper that it doesn't exist, and he found numerically a first a good hint that it, it does exist. And later, uh, Adam worked a lot to find this analytical solution. Because as you can guess, okay, we were slowly, slowly sl trying to find the analytical solution uh, using both numerics and analytics somehow. Okay, so you, you see here the solution, which is explicit, analytical, and you can check that it works. Um, and one more remark. Here is the same solution without numbers. But now the background is also denoted in some color. And those, those colors denote subspaces. We could see that the space of size 36 can be divided in nine, let's say, groups of size 4, for instance, two white background, red background, and so on. And then those officers or vectors, they belong to the same four-dimensional subspace. So in a sense, this huge 36-dimensional matrix can be split into blocks, nine blocks of size 4. And this was the key observation. Why? Because analytically, we could do never nothing with size matrices of size 36. But we could first reduce the problem to nine different problems in each block, write conditions for in each block, and then solving them analytically, we could eventually get those numbers analytically. So in a sense, our next paper is related to this equation, which again looks trivial, but for us it was not, that the 36 officers can be divided into nine, let's say, I would say, groups or cohorts of entangled officers, and there are only four officers which are entangled. And then what is, okay, uh, interesting that in some sense it may be it's related to sociology. So if you have, for instance, uh, okay, queens are coupled to, uh, okay, there is such a so, uh, representation that queens are coupled to kings, uh, let's say, um, pawns to uh, horses and um, rocks to, to um, bishops. Well, so I discuss a lot of uh, Euler problem and um, combinatorics and not much about physics. So now a little bit more about physics. So we know what are maximally entangled states, so like Bell states. But if you have higher dimensional system, there's nice analog of the Bell state, very simple. You have basically a uniform um, sum, so superposition with uh, D objects like this. So if D is two, it's just the Bell state. And the property is that all those singular values, so after partial trace, you get maximally mixed state. So all singular values of the corresponding matrix are equal. And the partial trace is one, which implies that this matrix C is unitary up to a scaling, because C, C dagger is proportional to identity. So here, unitarity is important. If this matrix C is unitary, then uh, the state is maximally entangled. For instance, if you take such a state, two qubit state, 0, 0, plus 0, 1, plus 1, 0, minus 1, 1, you might not see that it is equivalent to a Bell state. But it is because this matrix is unitary. You see, it's like Hadamard matrix, 1, 1, 1, minus 1. So in short, singular values of this made expansion matrix determine entanglement it's easy to compute them and check whether the c is unitary and what are the singular values of this matrix and there is an important definition which is like 20 years old maybe not 20 okay almost 2004 if you take multiple systems let's say oh, i have four objects here one two three four so i say ah i have four objects the state of four-party system will be maximally entangled, 
or absolutely maximally entangled. If we would be entangled with respect to this partition, AB versus CD, but also it will be entangled with respect to this partition, AD and BC. So absolutely maximally entangled means it is maximally entangled with respect to all possible symmetric partitions of the system. So a trivial example of such a case is the base state. Now there are no such states for four qubits, but there exist such states for four qubits. I will show them six q quads and so on. So you can ask what about such absolutely maximally entangled states of four subsystems with six levels each. And again, this question was not solved for, well, was posed like a few years ago, was not solved for at least 10 years. And here is a table of existence of those absolutely maximally entangled states. So green means they do exist, um, red does not exist. Here is local dimension D, here is number of parties, and this white spot corresponds just to the case mentioned. So six, four parties with six levels each. This was state of the art one year ago. This is the paper by Huber and, and Videlka. And now my claim is that our solution of Euler, of the quantum analog of the problem of Euler is exactly equivalent to solving this problem of absolutely maximally entangled states. So now here, after our paper, we can change this into green spot. We've found that such a state exists. So why do we care about AMA states? Well, because they are useful for many different purposes like quantum coding, teleportation, and so on. Um, for instance, such an AMA states of four parties allow you to teleport to Q, in this case, Q dits between any chosen uh, pair of uh, users to any other. And other states will not allow for such a, for such a object, for such a task. So um, I already showed you this uh, classical um, standard Greco-Latin square of size 3. Of course, we can, uh, instead of, uh, so, uh, Thomas, uh, sh uh, look, instead of, okay, a uh, of space, you can decode it as zero, zero, and so on. Now, this is more somehow standard way. And now, look, the key observation is simple. Each symbol, in fact, can be decoded into four digits, column, row, and uh, figure, and suit. And so here, I change ace of space into zero, zero, and king like one, two, and so on. But now, claim is that such an object immediately gives us armor state in the following way. First, I have two black, they are kind of address, so zero, zero is position, and ace of spades will give me here red zero, zero. Now I look to this uh, point, one, two, put it here. Uh, address zero, two, there's two ones, I put it there. And now in this way, I can immediately transcribe such an object into a state, and can show that the state is really armor state only because you have only one uh, card one uh, and one color in each column and row, and it offers you a corresponding quantum code. So I will not uh, discuss now, go into detail. I will only show that there is a really uh, important applications of those objects in uh, quantum mechanics, also quantum information. And now look, such a four-party state of four parties can be always written in such a product basis with such a tensor with four legs. So I have sum over I, J, L, M. So the state is, as I already mentioned, maximally entangled. We, if it's maximally entangled with respect to four different, three different partitions, which means that if you take it and perform partial traces with respect to, for instance, um, AD or AC or CD, you'll always get identity. Which means that if you take this tensor and combine two indices, like mu is equal to ij and nu is equal to lm, you get a unitary matrix. Unitary because u dagger is one. And the same has to happen if you change, take different choice of indices, which corresponds to different uh, splitting of the system into four parts. And then uh, such a tensor is called perfect, and such a unitary matrix of size d square is called two unitary. So in a sense, a uh, AMA state corresponds to such a two unitary matrix. And then our theorem is simple. Existence of such a 
quantum orthogonal Latin squares of size D is equivalent to existence of our armor states of four subsystems with D levels each. So here's again explanation uh, why this is so, that having such a um, quantum orthogonal Latin square, you can immediately rewrite it as an armor state. So I think I should slowly conclude. So it looks like I don't have time enough to discuss how do we obtain this state. If you wish and to have time, I can discuss it later. So here it is a short discussion how we got it. Okay, I will only say one thing. So we got it numerically and then we used local operations which do not change those properties. So this huge matrix and it's a way we could encode solution into matrix of size 36. And now we perform the local operations multiplying from, by U6 from left and right to take the full matrix and uh, imply some block structure, then to make those blocks smaller. And then in each block, we found, uh, wrote such a unitarity condition. We solved those unitarity conditions. We got those numbers, including 12, uh, 12, 20 roof of, of identity. Uh, so here is this matrix, which was a complicated matrix at the very end. And after permutation is block-like, it's unitary, so basically you have to write unitary conditions for each block, and they are relatively easy to solve analytically. This was the point. Uh, and here there's a geometric interpretation with pentagon, a Greek pentagon, so this number 20 here is also somehow inscribed and related to the symmetries which are necessary. So I think I should rather finish. Ah, so this is this example, another bridge language, that here what I promised you to show in this representation, you have like kings are only coupled to a uh, uh, so aces to kings, so like general to admirals and queens to jacks and tens to well they're to nines, yes. So in a sense, it's like um, cast system, yes. I think I should finish. So one remark is that if you are able, in principle, okay, we don't know how to generate the state yet, but maybe it will be doable. If you can generate your state of four dices, why dices? Because we have six uh, outcomes. So there is a six uh, system with six levels. If we generate such a state absolutely maximally entangled of four dices, measure any two of them, you can immediately reconstruct, uh, predict results of measurements performed of two others. And this is unique for, for, this, very, for this very state. And the last remark, we put it on the archive, the new version, okay, with the explanation and chess analogy. And I will uh, quote, um, so, okay, so concluding remarks are already done. Uh, so I will only mention uh, one uh, remark. So the paper discusses 36 officers of Euler. They are entangled because we allow such states. And we wrote, it is said to note that these Russian officers recently left their parrot ground in St. Petersburg, where they belong, and went a thousand miles south. However, explicit analytical results described in this work strongly suggest that the officers might eventually suffer a transition into a highly entangled state. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we have time for questions. We'll start with maybe uh, on-site participants. Clearly, I, I, I cannot understand details. What I have impression, and I want to ask if a correct impression. Starting from officer, officer have small number of features, and then you increase the number of feature. Right? The, the, each officer was replaced by roughly speaking some tensor with more indices and can i can you say that this um, picture is maybe a reducible representation of some reducible group it's very complicated look thanks for the question here i have discrete objects this is standard combinatorics so king let's say or let's put here a blue king is like zero zero it is a discrete object but now main assumption is that I allow, instead of those discrete objects, I allow to have quantum states. And only I assume, ah, if there are quantum states, you can easily write 
uh, coherent superpositions. So just maybe not to show you. Uh, okay, so this is a uh, one example of coherent superposition, like state, uh, w let's say three plus four in one subsystem or one uh, subspace. Here is another superposition. But maybe this example with explicit equations. Uh, shows here what I did. I allowed officers to be entangled, but I have not increased the size of the problem. I all also have 36 officers, officers, what it means in my case, 36 objects, but I allow for entanglement, allow to use superpositions of states. And therefore, I found the solution, of course, to be honest, not of the original Euler problem, but of the quantum analog of the Euler problem. Thank you. Yes? Do you have... Uh more on-site questions. Uh, first, Julius, and then there was a question of uh, Professor Nurovsky, I think, for a while. Yes, uh, I have a question about uh, construction of solutions. So you started first with a classical problem, and then you transitioned to a quantum problem. And I wonder whether uh, starting with exact or approximate solution in one case can help you to construct uh, some solution in the other case a classical to quantum and vice versa yes very very good uh, very good question so okay i have no time to discuss the details here is such a plot we take all unitary matrices first step is we could represent any possible solution by a unitary matrix of size 36. classical solution would be a permutation matrix unitary are larger at this axis i plot such a quantity like entropy which i want basically to maximize so my function I want to maximize is this entropy, which basically means I want to have the maximally entangled, it, we want to have entropy maximal. And here, this is some auxiliary variable G I don't need to discuss. Here are some matrices, so typical matrix will be somehow here. There are matrices by uh, Arul, Grzegorz, Wojciech here. So this was suspected to be the best for many, many, many years. And then what Suhail did, he found a uh, nice iterative algorithm. He took exactly, this was like permutation matrix, so exactly a classical solution. But the key trick was there are many permutations. But from this permutation, he was not able to go to the uh, uh, aim. But he could a little bit perturb it, perform this numerical complicated numerics, and this shows you how fast it converged after, let's say, 300 steps to this matrix which really gives you the optimal mm, solution. So this entropy is maximal as should in this unit one. So in short, the point was that not every, uh, this, uh, here is look, this is exactly this approximate solution to the problem. In this solution, you have two queens of diamond, which is wrong. And in this solution, uh, what is wrong? You have two jacks in this column or also two queens. So there are two different uh, approximative solutions written like this or like this. So one of those solutions gives you good result, one does not. Uh, provided you have a clever algorithm to, to proceed, yes? Okay. We had short a question of Paweł Nurowski, but then he lowered his hand. And yeah, I, I lowered know. because my question was answered. So. Thank you, Paweł. Thanks for being with us. It I'm was ple a pleasure. Pretty pleased that I could predict your question and answer it before you pose it. Thank you. So we have another question of uh, Tai. I can make a comment if I can. Yes, please do. Because I, I was thinking about your title because your title was at the, at the beginning was misleading. I, I was thinking that that you are having a solution of the classical problem by means of quantum methods. But then I was thinking that, that actually that's what what's what happening. It's like it's like you extended the space of the space of solutions. It's just like like equation x square x square plus one equals zero has no solutions among real numbers. But if you extend this space in which you look for solutions, you find the solution. So that's yes. That's, so it's uh, like extending the space of solutions. You yes, solutions. very much so. Thank you for this remark. Of course, you are right as usual. Yes, it is so. Thank you. Maybe my question is late to maybe his question, but first you uh, trended actually from classical problem to the quantum problem, yes. but uh, when we actually consider another classical problem, when you keep actually same size of actually board, mm -hmm. region, and then you just increase the degree of freedom, in that case, in that those problems, those actually problems are similar maybe similar or equivalent to the quantum problem. You just increase the degree of freedom, like a color or like a direction, but you keep the same actually the number of 
number of uh, entry. Uh, entry. So that is uh, equivalent to the quantum problem or not? Because yes. Look, uh, good question again. Um, the problem is almost the same, but allowing superposition of states. The mathematical framework is very simple. Instead of working in this permutation group of size d square, I start to work in the unitary group of size d square. In, in permutation, you have in each row, each column, you have only a single digit one, which corresponds that the officer is well defined. And in unitary, each row of unitary matrix corresponds to a, in a sense, officer. So corresponds to the um, object I will put, okay, uh, I will put on the blackboard. And then uh, this means that in this huge matrix of size 36, in my best possible representation, I have here two non-zero elements in each row, here two, here four, here three. So you see the, uh, what we did? We allowed not only permutation matrices, we went beyond the set of permutation matrices. Which allow which correspond to quant allowing quantum entanglement. Or something like this? Uh, no? no, 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 I don't think so because you have phases which are arbitrary and the space of quantum states. You cannot describe it only by classical means because it is infinite and is continuous. Why classical space of objects is of, of always discrete. So we embed discrete uh, set of permutation matrices into a larger continuous group of unitary matrices. I think that we have to finish because the time. But there is was a question of, of uh, okay. Uh, there are also there are two questions, but I propose that maybe you can ask the questions after this official part. So let's thank the speaker again. And of course, if you have some questions, you can do it uh, less formally. Now. Thank you very much. It was a really great pleasure to see all of you. Thanks for coming. And I will come to Warsaw again at some point. Thank you.